The spread of authoritarianism, uh, the rise of unlimited executive privileges and authorities uh, in country after country. Um, even you go, hey, you know, I'm worried about this. Maybe they can uh, track the virus better if they start doing this, that, or the other. Uh, as long as we stop this thing, this crazy, inhuman thing, um, it's worth it. Uh, and even if, you know, in a moment of reflection, you catch your breath, a week goes by, three weeks go by, the headlines don't have as much sting, uh, you start to adjust to the new normal, lean back, and think about it in a more considered way, on reflection, you start to go, well, you know, maybe, maybe I was a little bit rash there. Uh, recognize that as somebody who has like a self-identity as a critic of governments, uh, you're still very much ahead of the curve. And this is, I think, the most teachable moment in the current pandemic, something that we so often forget whenever there is a crisis uh, in any corner of the world that begins reshaping laws and reshaping societies and, and the boundaries of our rights uh, that we live in and, and defend and uh, over time try to expand. Uh, and that is that human emotion is itself viral. Um, this is one of the basic principles for internet and social media. You know, they've done studies on this and they've seen the emotions that have the largest uh, contagion are uh, anger and fear, right? And what we are seeing is we are seeing hysteria spread. And remember, uh, fear can be rational. Um, this is a serious problem. Uh, this virus is a serious threat uh, to public health and well-being and safety. And we should do what we can to mitigate it. But what we've seen uh, is a panic a sweep across the entire world. Uh, the political class, uh, the media class, the, the sort of commentariat, uh, and you can see it on the internet. You know, um, there's one group of people uh, who are trying to bury uh, any suggestion that this is serious at all, uh, absolute denialism of any facts and evidence that there could be some danger to this, uh, that we should put economic limits in place, whatever. Um, and then the other side of this uh, that says this is the end of everything, we're all going to die, everybody's going to get this, and, you know, it's just uh, they kiss your relatives goodbye because you're never going to see them again. Uh, and the reality, of course, is it's, it's more complex. It's somewhere in the middle. But that moment of intense, instantly transmissible fear uh, is what happened to us in 9-11. Um, it's what happens to us in the lead-up to every war. Uh, it's what happens to us uh, whenever the government is trying to start a campaign to, to gather uh, new authorities. They say, you know, we're going to protect you from uh, roving gangs. We're going to protect the children. We're going to do whatever we can. Um, and that moment, that window of vulnerability where rationality goes out of the window, um, <laughs> goes out of the room, we are, we are all susceptible to it uh, and that only on be positive we now we are only now beginning to get our feet under us and in the time that we now take a breath and start looking at what's happened uh, we see governments around the world in country after country uh, have already begin helping themselves to for example uh, the the mass movements of everyone everywhere to the maximum extent of their capability which they say is for tracking the spread of the virus uh, but all of the questions that, you know, in a more considered time we would have looked at, like, one, does this work? Is it effective? And if it is effective, is it worth the cost that we're paying? And how will we make sure that this is not permanent? This is not uh, the kind of emergency measure that we got, you know, 20 years ago. Everyone looks at these things and considers emergency measures, right? It's natural and it's appropriate in the context of human experience. Uh, when you have, for a short time and a short period, a level of sacrifice that needs to be made uh, for the good of the individual, for the good of the community, for the good of society, right? Um, think about, you know, you're on a raft in the middle of the ocean, you don't drink all your water on the first day, even though you might be thirsty. Um, the thing that I have a problem with is that we see, for example, in the economic context of what we have going on right now, um, we have a history, at least in American society, but I think really global society when we look at the last half century, of repeatedly asking sacrifices of those who have the least capability to make those sacrifices. Um, everybody is freaking out about the economic crisis that has been provoked by the fact that we're all at home. We're all shut in. Uh, we're socially distancing. Uh, we're engaged in uh, trying to flatten the curve 
of infections, right? Just the, the logarithmic curve for those who aren't following around where the virus rates of infection keep doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling, uh, will overload the hospitals, right? So we're trying to insert a breather uh, by sending everybody home, going, you're not going to see anybody, therefore you're not going to transmit everything, uh, and this will take the heat off the hospitals. And again, this can make sense. Uh, and I think it does make sense. Uh, the real problem that we're about to run into next is when they have to let everybody out and then infection rate begins to rise again. And there was a study that just came out of, I think, the uh, Chan School of Public Health uh, from Harvard, uh, where they were saying this uh, system of pumping the brakes uh, or of intermittent quarantine, uh, where they send everyone home and then they let them out and then they send everyone home and let them out, uh, will actually continue uh, into next year. Well, I think this depends on your personal perspective and philosophy as to what the role of government is uh, and where those lines are drawn. For myself, um, I actually don't think uh, the government should have the mandatory authority to say, look, nobody goes out, you can't leave, you can't do this, that, or the other. Um, but that's also for the point, a part of the reason that I feel that way Only on be is that I don't believe it's actually necessary. I believe if the government makes recommendations uh, and we have the kind of public education that's uh, of a quality that can convince people and persuade them rationally that they should limit the amount of time that they spend outside, that they spend in crowds, you know, that they're uh, in basically um, zones of, of potential infection and transmission. Uh, they will make the right decisions themselves. Uh, this actually gets into the contact tracing thing that we talked about as well. Is it better uh, for the government just to, you know, break out the jack boots and the uh, batons and go, look, nobody's out of their house, uh, or it's off to the paddy wagon? Uh, alternately, um, do you tell people, look, uh, this is dangerous to you, it's dangerous to your family, uh, this is a global pandemic, uh, you can reduce the risk to yourself, your community, if you follow uh, this kind of recommendation. And here's why we make these recommendations. Here's the basis for it. Here are the facts. Here's the best of our evidence and our science. I think most people will go along with it. This is similar to the idea of contact tracing. Now, currently, um, uh, again, for those listening that have been living under a rock and haven't heard of contact tracing, uh, this is where there is an infection uh, that has come into the hospital, they've tested positive, and then the doctors try to reverse engineer uh, where this person was to try to notify uh, other people who could potentially have been infected by this person and to try to basically crack down on the uh, contagion risk. Now, contact tracing really doesn't work when you're talking about the 10,000 people that are infected, 100,000 people that are infected, but it could work really well when you only have an infected population of 10 people, maybe 100 people, and they're, they're spread over the world. Um, so governments, to try to get ahead of the contact tracing thing, have just gone, well, why don't we go to the mobile companies, why don't we go to the internet companies, the advertising companies that are tracking everybody's location. Uh, the phone companies have your location whether or not you gave an app location permissions on your phone because your phone has to be connected to the nearest cell phone tower mm -hmm. in order to function, for you to make calls, for you to send internet data, for you to get notifications, any of that, right? Um, the phone company knows where you are at all times. Uh, the only way you can stop that is your phone is off uh, or the antenna is not hot because it's an airplane mode. Or, or you don't whatever. carry a phone with you. Or you don't carry a phone with you, right? Right. Uh, but for most people, that's not an option. They need it to, to work. They need it to be in contact with their family. They need it to pay bills. They need it for all of these other things. But yes, for most people that are walking around, they have this and it's constantly tracking them. If you do have location permissions on or you are connected to the local cafe Wi-Fi or you have Bluetooth on because it connects to your headset or something like that, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, uh, all of these things uh, can be used as proxies for location information. And these can be provided to those apps uh, secretly, in many cases, uh, due to intel in intentional weaknesses in sort of the privacy settings and the way the mobile operating systems are designed. Uh, or you agree to this once and then it's just constantly background, app is not even open, 
uh, as far as you can tell, but it's constantly sending updates to Facebook or to Google saying this is where that person is. And this, by the way, is how Google gets all those nice traffic maps, right? That tells you where the congestion is on the roadways. Uh, they're monitoring everybody's phone so they know how many people are Only on, on this roadway at this time. Well, governments are starting to go, well, why don't we help ourselves to that? Um, in some countries, it's a little bit harder. Interestingly, in the United States, uh, we're doing a little bit better here than other countries like, of course, China, Russia, but also Israel.